Marker. Okay. Okay. What I really wanted to have you start by telling us about was your family farm and what it was like, and especially thinking about the late twenties coming into the thirties. What? Tell me about your dad and how the farm got going and what you grew and all that kind of stuff. Well, it was a long time ago, but it was back in the early twenties when the worst things happened. In the meantime, there had been an ambition on the part of our family to own their own farm. They had been hired people and they had been renters, and now the time had come to have a farm of our own. And in the 1920 era, my father decided this is it. So he did a lot of puzzling about it because it was high, $400 an acre. But the bankers, the bankers in the community said, oh, Herman, you better buy now because next year it'll be at least a hundred year a hundred dollars higher and uh, so the farm was bought and we were all jubilant I was 12 years old at the time and I I was just as happy as could be that we now were like the rest of our neighbors we had our own farm but well unfortunately our dream didn't quite come out the way we'd planned it Within a year, the land prices in that community dropped severely. In fact, it would have been difficult, even if it had been possible to sell, to get anything more than $100 an acre for what we'd paid $400 an acre for just 12 months before that. And it was truly devastating because prices on farm products also plunged, plunged way down. I remember visiting uh, with some other folks of that era, uh, and, and they reminded me about the fact that hog prices dropped to two and a half dollars a hundredweight, as compared to at one time in more recent years that they were fifty-eight dollars a hundredweight, and other things in comparison, uh, corn, for instance, uh, although that comes at a later time, that comes in the early thirties, but corn plunged down to ten cents a bushel some people even less than that. And it was so uh, so terribly low that it was used for fuel. People burned it instead of coal. How were you personally affected by the, the economic collapse? What, what happened to your life? What, what had been your expectations? And what well, my dream had always been to become a famous author, and so I wrote little stories what? that... You just cut through. So uh, I forgot to think. Her plum bag take two up. Okay. okay, so actually, if you could just start again about how you were personally affected when, uh, and I'm now I'm thinking sort of 29, you know, after these these prices have come tumbling. Down. Well, naturally, the drop in farm prices and the terrible situation on the loss of land was very difficult for all concerned. However, my father, who had come to this country from Europe, was a bit on the stubborn side and he refused to let them take his land. So we struggled, but it did cost me a high school education, something I very much wanted. And uh, later on, <laughs> nearly cost me a college education. But uh, we, we just did the best we could. We ate very <laughs> poorly. We <laughs> didn't know very well. We had no such things as a social career, uh, uh, such things as we have nowadays. It was all really poverty, and it lasted through a period of time, into of course the late 1920s and into the early 30s, which really were about the worst. What did you do to get by? What was survival like on a farm like the one you lived on? Well, you made your old clothes do. Sometimes the shoes were a little bit uh, worn out and the soles were pretty thin. Uh, you uh, didn't do any buying, really. You just raised your own produce and the, the things you had to have, salt, sugar, and so forth, you managed to get that. But uh, it, was, it was plain hard work actually, and trying to survive, which we fortunately did. But uh, there were tough times. Uh, 
no money to buy coal, so you bought or you burned corn instead, which sounds almost in, unthinkable in today's world, but that's what we did. The machinery was made to last as long as it could. You simply have to fix it yourself. Of course, in those days we had horses, and <laughs> horses do get older in the as time goes along, but uh, we did get a colt every year, and that helped. And, uh, well, you just had to, had to make it do. We were not alone. There were many, many others. But most, actually, most people who had paid so much for farmland too high uh, lost the land. And then came all kinds of strange things like penny sales and Actually, things. I was going to ask you about that. So could, do, you, do you remember foreclosures or do you remember the mood in the community when foreclosures? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I certainly remember the mood at the time that we were losing our land. Uh, in many cases, there were suicides. People simply could not take it. They had worked so hard, they tried so hard to keep what they had, and it was taken from them. Other things that happened, neighbors would come together and they would learn about a sale that was about to take place, and they would all congregate hundreds of them, and they had an agreement among themselves that nothing would go higher than five cents. Well, if you had a corn planter that really should have been selling for $50 or more, and somebody offered five cents, obviously that sale never went through. The auctioneers went nearly crazy trying to get something for, but it was impossible. What was, um, how did people feel about the banks? Do you, have, do you remember what it was like at the time? What was the kind of yes, I certainly do remember that. There was considerable bitterness, particularly to those bankers who had advised farmers like my father to buy at what was a very high price with the argument that it was going to go higher. Everything was going to go out of reach through the sky. Well, they were wrong, dead wrong. And so there was a rather a strong feeling that bankers didn't know very much, or at least not as much as they should. Um, I'm just going to actually, right, let me skip ahead to another question. I was going to ask you about the farmer's holiday. Remember, what, can you give me some background on that? And what was the kind of mood and what was the thought behind the, the withholding of crops that they were trying to organize? The Farmer's Holiday was a movement uh, in which people who were rather hard hit uh, formed an organization which they did call the Farmer's Holiday. And actually it was a part of the overall procedure of stopping sales, uh, stopping actually marketing because they thought maybe if they stopped marketing uh, perhaps things would get better. Actually they did not get better. And uh, it became... Oh, oh, we just ran out of film. You are doing... End of the sound roll. Okay. So, yes, can you tell me about the farmer's holiday? The farmer's holiday was an unfortunate movement. It came about through desperation because farmers were so hard hit and were losing so much that uh, some farmers banded together, not, not a lot, but enough to make a, quite a, an impression. And uh, in the course of it, they tried to stop sales. They tried to stop production, actually, in many respects. But uh, it finally came to a tr almost tragic ending when they uh, dragged a judge at Sioux City, Iowa, off the bench, and uh, he was from the Lamar's Sioux City area, and he was actually dragged for a part of the time with the intent that they were going to hang him, actually murder him. But uh, better heads prevailed, and uh, this didn't happen, thank goodness. But it was a short-lived movement uh, a man named Milo Reno was a sort of an instigator of it, and uh, he and others who were very radically minded. Bear in mind now, there were other organizations, Farm Bureau, uh, 
uh, Farmers Union, the Grange, that uh, also were suffering, but did not go to extremes of that nature. It was a sad uh, commentary on our, on our farm uh, living at the time. Uh, I was gonna ask you your memories of, um, and Hoover, when he was elected, really came in with the pledge to do something for the agricultural crisis. He, he saw that and he set up the Federal Farm Board, which he hoped would help stabilize prices. Did that help you and your family's farming? <laughs> no, during the period of Hoover's administration, as you know, there were terrible things. The stock market dropped and uh, farming conditions were not improved. We in Iowa had hopes because Hoover was one of our own, an Iowa man, or born in Iowa. But uh, it didn't take very long and farmers were as opposed to him as anybody could be because conditions were frankly desperate. So the Federal Farm Board which, did that help? I mean, you didn't feel an impact? The Federal Farm Board was uh, set up with the intention that it would make a difference, but we didn't see it. Okay. Um, I was going to move forward now to, at the time of the 1932 elections, you had told, uh, you told Leslie a really interesting story, I thought it was, about your going with your dad to actually see FDR speak. I was wondering if you could just tell me that story again. Yes, uh, FDR was invited to the American Farm Bureau Convention in Chicago, which was quite a ways, nearly 200 miles from our farm. But by that time, my father and uh, many others in the community were totally convinced we had to have a change and we were going to cast our votes with President Roosevelt or with Mr. Roosevelt. And he came to Chicago and took the platform, and I remember it vividly because I had a fairly good seat. And here was this gentleman with a handicap, uh, struggling just a bit to get to the podium and, and to stand there, but uh, he spoke, and he spoke, you know, with such uh, vision, with such hope, with such uh, sort of, uh, oh, uh, the things we wanted to hear, frankly, <laughs> were being said. And uh, there was a large crowd that came from all over the country, or at least from all over the Midwest, and it was uh, uh, the, the turning point as far as many farmers were concerned because uh, Mr. Roosevelt did have some other plans. At least we were going to get out of the terrible bog that we were in. Did, um, was that unusual for your parents to be voting Democratic or, or to be looking to a Democrat? Uh, yes, my father was. Is Sarah gone? Yes. All right. So again, if you could just very concisely tell me about the cow wars. There was actually a cow war during those tough times in the early 30s. It was a case of the farmers uh, having to submit their herds to tests for tuberculosis. Some cattle were infected. We wanted to get rid of those and did, of course, by way of this test. But uh, in, unfortunately, there were enough who objected that it was necessary for the governor to call out the National Guard. And uh, they were encamped not very far from our farm, actually. So we went there, and I, that's the first war that I participated in. <laughs> it was a rather a quiet one. And uh, some uh, several hundred soldiers were encamped and uh, made sure that the testing was done. Actually, those who objected the strongest uh, were later imprisoned, one man for three years because he stood in the way of the law. The governor said he would carry out the law, and he did. Now, I do want to go back and just repeat a couple of things that you've already told me about, but can you give me an example in this period, 1929 to 32, these Hoover years, give me some just concrete examples of prices falling. Yes. Okay. The period from 1929 through 1932 was probably the hardest period in the history of American agriculture because prices fell terribly. They just dropped all the way to the bottom. I remember as a 4-H boy uh, 
in selling hogs for as little as two and a half dollars a hundredweight. Today they're uh, much higher, have been up to fifty-eight dollars per hundredweight. Sorry, could you do that? But think about they had rather than looking forward till today. I really like the way you worked in the 4-H, but instead of saying today they're more, All right. sort of that they had yeah. been, yeah. what had they been in, you know, sort of what had they been in 1925 or 1927? Do you remember? Well, yes, they varied uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, I actually have those figures. I actually have those figures. So again, the price is falling. The period 1929 to 1932 was a sad period in agriculture because prices fell terribly. As a 4-H boy, I had raised hogs, and uh, we sold them for anywhere from eight dollars a hundredweight uh, up to 15, something like that. But by the time of the early 30s, hog prices had dropped down to as low as two and a half dollars a hundredweight. Corn had dropped down to 10 cents a bushel, so low that it was used for fuel instead of coal. And other prices were somewhat comparable, but they were times when it was just utterly impossible to raise the livestock or the crops for what they were being priced at the market. It was a rough, rough period. So then what would happen to someone like your father who had taken out a mortgage with high land prices and no longer was able to pay? How that all... Well, when we hit the low period, many farmers lost their land because prices on land dropped from what had originally been paid, in many cases $400, even $500 an acre, dropped down to $100 an acre, uh, or even less, and, and no one would buy it. It was a period when the land was worth nothing. What, was the, uh, what did you feel like? Were you scared as a young child? Young man. Well, yes, I was not happy about what was happening, but I think we all know in those days when you're younger, <laughs> you kind of <laughs> dream ahead a little bit and say, it isn't always going to be this way, and uh, fortunately it wasn't. But it was tough, very tough. I think I've mentioned before that I didn't get to go to high school, and that hurt, uh, whereas uh, I wanted to very much, and some of my early ambitions of becoming a famous author and things like that changed quite a bit when I became a lowly hired man, and that's about as low as we could be in those days. So now, what, so your family, can you tell me that, how your family made a decision? They basically decided to have you come back and work on the farm rather than have hired labor, is that? Well, there was no choice for my parents. They had to have help. They could not afford to hire someone. I was 14 or 15 years old. Uh, and uh, I was fairly able-bodied, and I became a hired man. Uh, my salary, incidentally, was not in cash. It was in four acres of land. And I soon found out that by producing certain crops like tomatoes and sweet corn and uh, uh, things of that nature instead of wheat or corn, I did pretty well. And uh, I became a kind of a plutocrat in the neighborhood. I wanted to ask you one more time about um the way people felt about the bankers when, when this, this kind of cascading, this, you actually used a phrase when you talked to Leslie about a domino effect um, of the way kind of uh, things just fell down. How did people feel about the bankers foreclosing? Well, the bankers were, in part at least, to blame for some of the things that happened because they led us and many others to believe that things were going to go higher. Instead, of course, they plummeted, plummeted terribly. And so the feeling against bankers turned from, well, this is the man we ought to listen to, to this is a person that hasn't done us any good. We won't pay much attention to him anymore. However, there were good bankers as well as those who had overstated things. Nevertheless, the feeling was not too kind toward the financial authorities in the community. Next, we're, we've changed to a new to camera roll, 312-20, uh, Herb Plumpack takes six up. Okay, so please tell me about the time you and your dad went to see FDR. One of my most vivid memories was when I was a lad and 
President Roosevelt, or I oh. should say. Yeah, just like uh, to start again to say Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, yeah, Franklin. Uh, one of the most vivid memories of my boyhood was when Franklin Roosevelt became a candidate for president, and we had had uh, a very rough go. And Mr. Roosevelt came to Chicago to attend the American Farm Bureau Convention, and he made a talk in which, of course, he he made some very hopeful presentations about what we might expect if he were president. And uh, that changed a lot of minds. Uh, my father had been a Republican, but no more. After that, he became a Roosevelt fan and always was because it was a much better period for all of us. Now you were going to tell me something about the kind of life that you yeah. had on the farm, the all social right. life. In all this, right. in yeah. this. <laughs> What was life like um, in these relatively impoverished times? Life during the Depression was a very different kind of life for us young people than what it would have been today. We had uh, very little to look forward to other than going to church every Sunday and attending you know, the young people's sessions. We played ball. We did get together our, our community and we had teams and we thought we were pretty good and we had a lot of fun in that respect. When it came to such social functions as dances, I remember vividly going to our neighbors where we had the dance in the corn crib in the <laughs> instead of in a nice dance hall. But we had as much fun as you could have had at the Aragon uh, uh, ballroom in Chicago. And of course, we got to meet the girls and the girls got to meet us and it was one of those same old thing. You don't change human nature that much, even with a depression. I'm really interested, just because you were talking about the community. Were there ways in which the community got together and helped people who were in need, helped people? Oh, yes. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, farm people are very neighborly. And if someone is in need of help, the neighbors will gather together, even at the expense of their own uh, time or, or cost, for that matter. Uh, this has been traditional throughout the ages, and it was especially true during the Depression when someone was hard hit. And that's, of course, how it happens that at some uh, instances where there was a plan to sell out a farmer, uh, the neighbors saw to it that it didn't happen. What kinds of things, do you have specific memories of how people did help each other, things that people would give each other? or? Um, how, oh, sure. Happened? If there was an injury or a death in a family, the neighbors would come together and they would f help harvest the crop or plant the crop, whatever the case may be. Uh, whatever was necessary was done and the neighbors, almost without exception, would all join in and make this uh, uh, happen and make it uh, mean a great deal to the bereaved family or the family that was in need of help. What, um, were there also times when people had to help each other with food or clothing because of the depression. Was that something? That uh, well, in the rural areas, most people depended on their gardens very heavily and on their chicken house and on the eggs that came from the chicken house and the pork that they pr processed themselves. The same thing was true of beef and other livestock. Uh, no, for the most part, we were uh, fairly well fed. <laughs> we certainly didn't have some of the exotic items, but we were. Uh, getting nutritious food from our own farms and gardens. Okay, great. Cut. Oh, what's wrong with this? Next is room tone for uh, her pump interview. <laughs> 